composed this piece. I didn't know how to describe it. Um, was it acousmatic music? Um, was it soundscape composition? Or was it some kind of a hybrid? Um, this is the first time in a piece of music um, that I'd used real world sounds, uh, the majority of which I'd left pretty much untreated. Uh, at first, I found this uncomfortable. Um, how would I get away with this? Uh, with my colleagues, uh, normally I'd spend hours in the studio crafting and shaping these sounds uh, to create new ones. And here I was just cleaning up recordings that I'd made. Um, and I, I kind of wondered whether I would be perceived as a bit of a fraud. Um, eventually, I reconciled myself to the fact that what I wanted was for listeners to kind of dwell in the presence of these sounds and to savour them. So the title of the piece, ABZA, -A, which has been notoriously difficult for people to pronounce, uh, if it ever gets performed on Radio 3, I'd love to know how the continuity announcer will deal with it. But ABZ um, is the airport identification code for Andy. And A is the maritime equivalent. Um, and what I wanted to do for me at that point, 1998, I'd been living in Aberdeen for seven years. So I was still an incomer. I actually, having been there now 24 years, I'm still an incomer and will remain that. However, my children uh, are accepted. Um, but I'm not. Um, anyway, I can still compose music um, about this particular place. And at that time, Aberdeen meant um, some things to me, but they kind of hovered around, excuse the pun, the airport uh, and the, and, and the harbour. Um, there's a lot of history in Aberdeen um, about fish, uh, which is now no longer um, uh, part of Aberdeen's um, um, kind of commerce, if you like. But the harbour has now changed into an uh, oil um, research vessels harbour, uh, if you like, so it's still an incredibly important part of the, of, of the city. Uh, and ABZ, the airport, is the way in and out, but it's also the way out, the helicopters out to the rigs, um, um, and so on, which is the lifeblood of the economy of the, of the region. Um, anyhow, um, it's about Aberdeen. It was a five-minute um, uh, commission from Radio Scotland to use sounds from a particular place. Um, so I'm going to play you an example, a um, um, short example of, of the piece. <coughs> of sounds that you might recognize. Um, if you've been to Aberdeen, you might actually recognize some of them, but certainly to the recognized types of environments that they, they take place. Um, if we go back to um, the sound um, just before the accordion is started to play, we've already heard this today, actually, the sound of a pedestrian crossing. Um, that place where that is recorded, um, quite often when I perform this piece and play it in Aberdeen, there's always someone in the audience who says, I know where that is. I know where you are. You're crossing the road between the St. Nicholas Centre and the Bonham Court Centre. Um, and it's quite interesting, is that for me? Um, because I'm quite interested in listeners' multiple, or the multiple levels of associations 
that are associated with sounds in, in one particular audience. So if you've been to Aberdeen, and if you've stood there, actually it's an interesting place to stand. You have to stand and stop because there's traffic coming down. And when you stop, maybe there's some kind of subliminal listening taking place. Uh, and it goes into your data banks. And then I can just draw on that memory for people who stood there unconsciously listening. Um, and they go, I know where you are. So that's where we are. Full marks if you get that. But it doesn't matter actually, because full marks if you got that as well, it's a first rate <coughs> somewhere in the United Kingdom. Also full marks for it's some kind of alarm or a warning signal. And also full marks for, I have no idea what the hell that is, but I'm going to make something kind of interesting as a sort of image um, in my mind as to what that is. So those four rough categories of levels of association, that's what interests me, uh, and certainly interests me in this uh, particular piece. So it's not important that the listener goes to School Hill, that exact place where I recorded it, but that they go to a place. And it's important that the listener does go there, because as a sound artist, I can bring a place to the listener but they need to invest in it, they need to go to it, otherwise it remains a one-dimensional object, merely brought by me into a space. So despite the fact that there's a great deal of acousmatic material in that piece, um, as previously mentioned, this barefaced presentation of field recording scared the hell out of me uh, to start off with. Uh, why would I bring all these real-world <coughs> sounds into the concert hall? Um, was it acousmatic? Was it soundscape? Does it really matter? Barry Truax defined soundscape composition as um, in terms of mimetic discourse and abstracted syntax. But what also characterizes it most definitively is the presence of recognizable environmental sounds and contexts, the purpose being to invoke the listener's associations, memories, and imagination related to the soundscape. So it's quite clear that parts of ABZA fall under this definition of soundscape composition, pedestrian costume that I just described. But what are the acousmatic elements of the piece? The interplay between manipulated wave sounds from the sea and the wave shapes of traffic movement. The harmonic material two-thirds of the way through the piece derived from the ambient sounds in Union Street. It's that street again in Aberdeen. As Hildegard Westerkamp has suggested, perhaps airtight definitions are not always helpful. So in 2006, I ventured uh, for the first time uh, towards creating sound art for experience away from the concert hall. Um, with a project called the Gordon Soundscape. The four elements of the Gordon Soundscape um, are built from field recordings, um, which are made in the Gordon District, which is the, it's a fairly big chunk of Aberdeenshire, recently made famous because uh, a certain Alex Salmond is now the MP <laughs> for that particular district. Um, some of these are my own response uh, to these recordings and my response to living there and include oral environments that are personal for me. Some are recordings made as a result of interviewing people of all ages in the area, and some are recordings, quite importantly, of sounds I knew were about to disappear. Something very closely associated with belonging to a particular place. Take the sound away. Murray Schaefer talked about uh, disappearing sound marks. And so these are the four parts of the project. Um, there's the website address. Uh, Resound is the sound documentary, and two acousmatic pieces, Field of Science and Still Voices. Um, Still Voices, uh, we're going to hear in this evening's concert. So I'll say a little about this. Um, so in the early stages of this project, um, I was invited to uh, Glendronach Whiskey Distillery, which is always a nice thing to be invited to a whiskey distillery. And this is near Huntley. Um, and they asked me to record some keynote sounds associated with their everyday working environment, which were about to disappear. They have a, a process of making whiskey. It was the last one in Scotland where they used um, coal fires underneath the stills to warm the, um, um, the, the the liquid in the stills. Uh, and obviously, uh, they were needing to move on to something more um, environmentally friendly uh, than coal. Uh, and the guys who worked there, they had um, various um, activities um, that they needed to, um, um, whoops, so they needed to um, do. Um, and these involved a lot of sound. The opening and closing of the kiln doors, which were underneath the stills, the raking out of the ash in the kilns, and then emptying of the ash hoppers. So they wanted me to go and record these sounds because they knew they were going to disappear in six weeks' time um, because they were having to uh, change their processes. So um, here's the sound of the kiln doors closing. <laughs> Absolutely gorgeous sounds. Um, just perfect for an acousmatic composer. Lovely kind of uh, harmonics. <laughs> Squeak. Raking out the kilns. Bit 
so that sounds like it's already been treated, um, but it's uh, absolutely wonderful. And the empty the ash hoppers. <laughs> So I used these uh, in the piece uh, that I made because I, I was just recording sounds for the sound map because you know, I wanted to kind of preserve these sounds and stick them on the sound map, which I'll show you in a minute. But actually, I ended up spending the rest of the day uh, just wandering around um, and recording um, elements of the whiskey manufacturing process. Um, so here is uh, an example where I used some of those sounds uh, taken from the piece. fascinating effect on the people who work there because the sound of that room now is just the sound of a, of a hard drive on a computer um, because nothing else goes on and it was a really big noisy industrial uh, kind of uh, environment for working before. Quite a lot of the people had retired. Um, I don't know if it's anything to do with it not being sound there. I'd like to think it was. Um, but uh, when I put those speakers behind this, um, the, the various stills and played the piece back with some of these sounds in there, it had a really interesting effect and quite a few of the people who remember the sounds came to tell me how much they missed those sounds and again nostalgia and thinking back memory and all of these things that have been taken away i was really pleased with that as um, um as a you know um, as a byproduct of, of, of the piece if you like um, these links between sound and memory uh, and loss uh, perhaps um, are associated um with well, what, what murray schaefer calls refers to as a sound romance which is any past or disappearing sound remembered nostalgically, particularly when idealized or otherwise given special importance. So I'd like to show you um, the map. Uh, this is the Golden Soundscape website. Um, click on enter, um, and then a pop-up window comes up. This is the first time I've ever done anything with sound maps. Um, fortunately, it's slightly broken at the moment. Um, <laughs> But uh, the, the principle is you go to, let's go to Collison here um, on the coast. And you click there and then you get a little zoom in here. Uh, normally when you, uh, it's working, you can click on that and it will come up in the field notes here with a little bit of description. So what I'm going to do is in fact just play um, the Collison sound. And you can look at the map. This is a cave. Um, 
There are others on there uh, that I could play, but I, I won't. But um, um, it should be up and working again in a week, uh, if I can get some time to play around with the flash um, aspects of it. Um, but um, um, <coughs> it's something that's worth having a, a, have a look around, I think. Going back to... Murray Schaefer again, who talks about museums for disappearing sounds. And this is something that he wrote back in the 70s. At the age of 40, I have many sound memories, which are no longer to be heard. Milk bottles, steam whistles, bicycle bells, horseshoes being tossed against a metal spike. Everyone will have such a list. We listen back and notice how much has slipped away unperceived. Where? Where are the museums for disappearing sounds? I think the internet is where the, the place is for the museums for disappearing sounds. Sound maps, sound repositories. You'll have heard of the BBC's mapping of the sound of the coast um, in conjunction with um, the British Library, which was announced um, <coughs> uh, earlier on last week. So I think that this, this, is, the, this is the place. It's also interesting to know um, that some of these sounds won't have been heard for a very long time. Um, when Murray Schaefer was talking about them just disappearing, um, none of those exist. Milk bottles, that's, that's a sound that is just kind of not there because nobody's ever heard of them. And these disappearing sounds are really quite important to um, to preserve them, if you like. Okay, um, two further sound map projects I want to talk to you about. Um, this one's called um, Hilton Soundscape, which I run in Google Earth. Um, and so uh, what we see here is the campus of the former Northern College in Aberdeen, the Teacher Training College, um, which when I went to Aberdeen, um, that's where I worked for a number of years until uh, Northern College merged with the University of Aberdeen um, in uh, early 2000. Uh, this campus, uh, we left the campus in 2005. And so one of the things that I did was to email uh, various colleagues and say, are there any sounds um, that you want me to record? Um, and I can preserve them. Most of my colleagues think I'm a lunatic anyway. <laughs> and so I got a, a, a number of people got back to me, but uh, uh, quite a lot didn't. Um, but anyway, I made uh, recordings in these different places. I'm sorry you can't actually see uh, too much uh, definition there. Um, but I'll just give you an example. Um, so this is uh, the ambience outside D block, um, which is the main uh, block for that. So. So you see, there's some text there, oyster catchers, the site used to be a breeding ground for oyster catchers, some seagulls, light aircraft passing overhead. So I'd started putting information in there, a little bit of text to describe it, listen to the sound itself, um, location of it, um, in case you wanted to then go and get a buy a map and go and stand there um, and, and listen to it. Oyster catchers is a sound mark of Aberdeen. Uh, very much so, as are seagulls. Pretty much every recording you make in Aberdeen has a seagull in it, mm -hmm. um, somewhere. But um, again, you know, uh, it's about capturing and preserving, if you like. But the, the main thing for this um, piece for me, and the reason why I've done it in Google Earth, is um, at the top here, you'll see this bar. This is something called historical imagery. I don't know whether you've played in Google Earth, you can see this, but you can go um, and look at every image that Google has either taken or has acquired. Um, at various times. So this is in 2001. Um, when we left the campus, um, they did this to it. Um, and uh, then that, and now that. Okay. So there's a campus now, which is um, uh, quite an exclusive uh, housing estate <laughs> called the campus. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what I'm thinking with this project now, so this is now exactly 10 years since I recorded. I haven't released this yet, um, but I'm just about to, because what I want to do is to email uh, these people uh, that live here, and I'll ask them the same question. Are there any sounds here now that you want to catch? And someone might actually say, the oyster catches still, they sound quite nice, and I might go and record them, but I'm going to put a, a layer of red pins. Um, of sounds that this particular constituency of people uh, and what belongs to them and put them on the top because the yellow ones from 2005 are still there even though those sounds don't exist anymore. 
the shutting of doors and the sound of the fume covered in the science labs in D-block, things like that. But they might, that constituency that you can see might be interested in those. Um, and we get this kind of sonic archaeology, kind of layers of sound. Um, when that gets uh, knocked down and a Tesco gets put there, I'll do the same thing um, again. Um, or someone, or my children, or my children's children. I don't know. But it's this idea of sonic archaeology that's, um, that's quite important to me. Um, another project um, is one that's uh, ongoing um, and hopefully will be for a long time, which is a sound mapping project of Aberdeen called Aberdeen Sound Sites. At the moment, we have about, I think, about 180 sounds that have been recorded by, by people. This isn't me now going out and making these recordings. Um, this is people uploading sounds themselves, so it's community driven. Um, so it's not my choices, and, and that's really quite important. Um, so uh, what you have is the same, the usual kind of thing. Uh, let's go, um, this is a nice one, Hedgehog Courtship. I really do like this. <laughs> so you click on this, um, and it takes a while. There we go. So you've got information. Two hedgehogs uh, engaged in their noisy courtship ritual. There's distant traffic noise uh, and then a hel helicopter. Underneath that, we've got tags, traffic helicopter animals. So you can actually tag these sounds now. Um, and so we can group them together. <laughs> if you've never heard hedgehogs um, attempting to <laughs> get to know each other a little better, um, that's it. There's a slight um, addition to this uh, map as well, which I think is really quite important. Um, and that's its uh, connection to uh, social media. So you can make a comment. Um, because we, we ask people to make a comment about the sound that they record. And then we want people who listen to make a comment about the sound that they've heard. Um, and so then that can link up to Facebook or to Twitter. Uh, and then that can be go out onto those networks. Because one of the things that we're hoping will happen with this is we'll get sound conversations. Um, one idea might be that um, someone in, in Australia who left Aberdeen many years ago might hear the sound of a place where they used to uh, live as a child uh, and they haven't heard the sound of that place for a long time, so they might want to talk about what it used to sound like and we get people actually engaging in the act of discussing uh, sonic environments and so on. Okay, so those are two um, sound map projects um, that um, I'm involved with at the moment, um, and the sound sax one will, um, will develop um, uh, in the future. Now, um, let's talk about um, uh, a very recent, um, quite extensive project. Uh, so you may have heard me talk about the Open Cities project before. Um, this is funded by the Sound Festival um, and uh, is, takes place in these, took place in these three cities of Aberdeen, Bergen, uh, and St. Petersburg. Um, it's a project that we at Surge, uh, Jun, myself, and, and Ross White um, were involved with over a period of two years. So the project involves contribution, participation, and experience of sound from the three, uh, these three northern cities. And one aim is for uh, all participants, including the public, to learn about and engage with the oral culture of each city through engaging with sound recordings um, made there. Another aim is for the three composers to actually involve, uh, sorry, involve an examination of their approaches um, to sound selection, sound transformation in relation to, uh, to place. The project consists of um, three concert works, two of which you'll, sorry, one, the Heritage is another one that you'll hear this evening by Ross White, um, which is a sound walk essentially through the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, um, along with various other things. Um, an intermediate installation, um, there's a paper and book chapter, uh, sound maps in each three city, of course, and then a project blog at, at that address. Um, one of the main ideas driving the project is, is Jun's three engagements with place um, when creating soundscape composition. The first engagement with place occurs when we visit, dwell on, and experience the place. Whilst listening attentively to sounds is our primary intention in this first engagement, we also acknowledge that the other four senses are present um, with the experience of the sounds and it works simultaneously to create the totality of our experience of the place. What is interesting in this first engagement um, with place is the fact that we do not merely experience it, we experience the sounds and we also record them. A careful examination reveals that recording is not merely about collecting sounds, as many might assume, 
Rather, it is as much about acting on the place as about collecting part of our listening experience of the place. This is indeed the essence of recording. When we record, we not only collect sounds so that we can use them for our compositions, but the act of recording also allows and even forces us to listen differently than what we might otherwise do. We might think of that as we are here. The second engagement with place occurs when we return from the place uh, and begin composing. Based on or about our experience of the place and using the recorded sounds either as actual materials or as inspiration. The goal in this engagement is mainly, but not always, about creating, that is representing or recreating, not the place itself, but our impression and experience of the place. More importantly, the backdrop of our compositional processes is to recognize the interaction and collusion between the previous experience of the place and the current experience of the sound recording. We can say that as we were there. Finally, the third engagement with the place happens when we listen to the recreation representation of the experience of the place, without having any direct experience of the place ourselves. In this third engagement, composers experience a constant transition between second and third stage of engagement. In fact, this transition between the two phases takes place because of the composer's desire to go back to the first engagement. However, it's never possible to go back to that first phase, and thus the composers are left with resorting only second engagement. So, um, we can refer to that as we wish we were there. Sounds were captured from visits made to the three cities, but only Jun and Ross went to Bergen. Similarly, Ross and I visited St. Petersburg without Jun. And as residents of Aberdeen, we all three recorded sounds there. So if we use the Bergen stage as an example, Ross and Jun's presence whilst recording the material, first engagement, meant that they would have a different relationship with the place than I did. I was sitting at home, uh, Skyping, seeing how it was all going, and they were sending me sounds via, uh, via the blog uh, and SoundCloud. Um, so they would have a different relationship with the place from me, um, so I could only have second and third engagement with the sounds. Similarly, listeners, i.e. you, listening <coughs> to Heritage, um, will only ever reach third engagement. Okay, So that's the we wish we were there stage. Just to exemplify this, um, in Bergen, Jun and Ross were there. Um, I was thinking, what on earth are they going to send me? I've got to work with these materials. What am I going to do? I usually go out and I select my own sounds because I'm drawn to them um, and I'm attracted and want to make that, record that because I know I can do something with it. Here, I'm having to work with other people's choices. And that actually, um, I thought, was going to be quite difficult. But we managed. Um, and I want to just play an example of a sound that I was sent. Um, I didn't look at any image that said photographs as well. I didn't look at it. I just wanted to listen to the sound. And they sent this. I'll play you a little bit of it. in this, um, you know, uh, I started listening deeply to it and imagining what it might be, uh, listening to the musical potential of the sounds, that gradual crescendo of the chugging sound, timbral variation as the sound moves closer, creating a sense of it being part of a large space. Um, only after I started to work with the sound um, did I actually want to know what it was, and it's this ferry which goes across Bergen Harbour uh, every four minutes or so. Nine people can stand in it, it's a passenger ferry. Um, I'm glad I, and Ross recorded it because it didn't exist anymore. They've actually, two years ago, they got rid of it. Um, another disappearing sound mark of Bergen, if you've been to Bergen two, before two years ago, you would have heard this um, in the distance. So I didn't want to be kind of um, directed visually by what it was. I wanted to use my imagination when I was creating it. Uh, and so when I used this sound in the Three Cities piece,
Um, that's the, uh, uh, how I use that. One of the things that we found is that that sound was used by Ross in uh, one of his pieces. I'm not sure, Jim, whether you used it. Um, I don't think so, no. Um, but Ross, we had a discussion about this, and um, I um, just went to town with it um, because I didn't have any kind of ownership in the same way that Ross did. When Ross used it, he found that he had much more of a reverence for it, possibly, um, and, and didn't want to change too much of it because he'd gone to it and, and, and wanted to capture it. Whereas for me, it was material that I could just manipulate because I didn't have a closer relationship with the sound because I only had that second engagement uh, rather than the first engagement that Ross had. Okay, just to finish up with then. So for me, notions of place have become the most important driving force behind my work as a sound artist. I try to bring places to spaces where listeners can choose to go to these and our other places, all the time involving the activity of deep listening. As human beings, we have a desire to understand the inevitability of a relationship between ourselves and place. And in trying to understand this relationship, we have told stories, drawn paintings, and taken pictures. But thanks to the development of sound recording technology, we can record sounds in one place and play them back in another, granting us new possibilities of understanding our relationship with place through sound. Thank you very much. changed it there and I think in the future we need to, particularly this that I want to keep going for a long, long time we need to build these things in yeah. Just to say how much I appreciate the, uh, the notion of recording that whiskey distillery <laughs> and that, um, I grew up in the black country right. and my grandfather lost his hat <coughs> to a machine my father lost his hearing to a drop towards you um, those memories those spaces are now covered in warehouses and shopping malls. Yeah. And the spaces, yeah. they're silent. Yeah. The history of that space, mm. uh, you know, which has carved itself certainly on my family, mm. is silent now. Mm. So, you know, great concept. Mm. I think, thank you, I think it's really important. It's like I said, it's one of Pete and Sean's, um, that space that you were in, the fact that it was a record shop before, is that it's actually not silent in here. It's, mm. it's still there. Mm. It, can still keep that if we've got the memories. Sure, that's but when I die, yeah, I can't pass that to my children. No, you and know. I can only pass on a document, yeah, uh, you know, of it. But it's at least somewhere towards it to, mm. to kind of preserve mm. things. Like that. Any other questions? Um, it's that I thought that was really great. You, you, the music you 
gave me some um, great possibilities for, um, I think it's a dementia study. Mm -hmm. You know, because um, you may need to think, like, it, it might be very powerful for all of us to record some experiences, some sound experiences, possibly between the ages of 50 and 25, when, that, when we're most likely to remember them. But later, we can replay them, and that might be quite powerful in, 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 our, in our, our older age. I think those of, us, yeah, those of us that have been making sound recordings for a large number of years, I think that's a very important thing for us. And I, I sometimes, <laughs> if I think, oh, I'll just go back and, and, and listen for that. And you know, maybe I need to grab it really quickly to put it in a piece. And I spend hours listening to it and all the other things I recorded then and, and just wallow in that memory of, of that because I've been able to capture it. And they, they talk about senses and memory and sound is so closely related but not quite as much as smell. That's just I've seen, a little um, bit more. I've seen some work where um, really very vague elderly people mm -hmm. literally come up to life when yeah. they hear mm -hmm. something. And, and in a tiny way, it's like that uh, with the workers at the distillery who heard the sounds in that space again. A huge rush of nostalgia. Um, and some of them were, were quite moved by hearing it. And they also thought, well, why would anybody want to? When I first went, they said, why would you want to do this? And that's proof as to why I want to do it. Yeah, well, bodies remember so much, don't mm -hmm. they? And like you said, by the way, necessarily are aware of it or not. Yeah. There are many, many sound maps. If you go onto the um, one of these links, I'll leave this. This says links, um, and there's a there's a huge collect there's a small collection there of of, of of sound maps that I'm adding to bit by bit. But you know you'll find them all over the place if you're just googling sound map or looking at some of the work of people like Kathy Lane and Angus Carlyle uh, and people who Peter Cusack has done a tremendous amount of work with sound maps as well. Um, Apple Reed. Um, is a great place uh, to get many links out of the Apple Reef site. Um, and um, uh, London, New London Sound Survey is another one that links out to many sound maps. But uh, there are quite a lot of, of sound maps out there. Montreal, Toronto are two quite well known ones. Barcelona's got a fantastic one. Barcelona, yeah. Actually, Ian's site, the London Sound Survey, has yeah. a compilation. Yeah. Of, is he kind of, Ian um, Rose. Rose, who runs it, he. He's sort of a bit completist in trying to collect <laughs> everyone that exists in the world. Yeah. And he has some very interesting ones that are mapped in different ways. Mm -hmm. So there's a Braille sound map actually of London, mm -hmm. and ones that aren't that are a bit more that are just sort of more tangential in the yeah, way they approach more mapping. Just situationists. Sort of yeah. yeah. Kind of yeah. Things, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we've probably got time for one more. So it might be a slightly strange thing, but has anyone ever done a sound map of somewhere that doesn't exist to try and create uh -huh. a world that way? <laughs> well, the, the, uh, uh, first, the project I did was um, to think about a, a place that, that never exists. So uh, uh, my wife uh, wrote me a uh, list, of se list of 76 cities that she believes they wouldn't exist. So I had a I had a name of the cities, and then I pick one and make a piece, and I pick another one and make an inspiration. So based on the assumption that uh, you can perhaps uh, uh, give evidence if if you give enough evidence, then maybe people will believe that this place will exist. And uh, uh, I'm, the piece that I'm going to play tonight, and welcome to Hasla. That Hasla is imaginary city. Um, Yes, so it's a, so it's a fascinating uh, project, project idea. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, <laughs>